Okay, I think as you are finding your seats, we will get underway because uh, we don't have all that much time and we still have a great deal to discuss. People are coming in generally. As I say, if you want to move forward a little bit, then we won't feel so lonely uh, as we are less numerous than this morning. So, welcome back to this session on doing business within and beyond the region. We discussed this morning the importance of business cooperation to meet the wider objectives of the Eastern Partnership and to deliver those benefits, that enormous potential in terms of delivering growth and jobs in partner countries. And we underline the opportunities that exist on both sides. We talked about the key challenges to realize that potential and the key steps that are needed to create the right conditions. But all of this, of course, happening in a much bigger context than just the EU and the Eastern Partnership. So we're going to focus on the wider context of a globalized trading system. The opportunities that are opening up for doing business with partner countries, not just with the EU, but with other regions of the world. What impact EU's relations, trade negotiations with other parts of the world might have on partner countries? And what can partner countries to do to make sure they can take advantage of any new opportunities that open up as a result of that. That's what we're going to discuss. With me, I have uh, a splendid panel to discuss this. I'm particularly delighted to welcome Cecilia Malmström, who is the European Commissioner for Trade, uh, Wilhelm Molterer, Vice President of the European Investment Bank, Marcus Beira, back uh, with us this afternoon, Director General of Business Europe, and Hendrik Bourgeois, who is Counsel for Europe, Head of Government Affairs and Policy for Europe at General Electric. So, let us jump straight in. Uh, in the European Commi uh, Commission's communication on the future of the European neighbourhood policy, it talked about identifying areas of common interest and described trade as one of the strongest. Um, I just want to get a sense from you of how you see now the role of the Eastern Partnership in, as I say, this broader context of a globalised world, developments on the bilateral stage and on the multilateral stage. How does it fit in to that bigger picture? Commissioner. Well, of course, it does fit in uh, because trade is still the, uh, at the centre of the Eastern Partnership and of our neighbourhood policy because trade brings so many other good things than just the exchange of, of, uh, of goods and services. It brings people closer to each other. It uh, brings new technology, new ideas, innovation. It m makes business, uh, trade unions, uh, people meet in, in, in a way that, that is integrating and that is uh, beneficial for, for, for the whole neighbourhood. Uh, but of course the Eastern Partnership is, as you say, it's, it's one of, of so many things that is happening in the global world. So everything is in a way connected, but one should not exaggerate uh, that, uh, that either because of course there are lots of bilateral agreements being negotiated, some, some uh, uh, regional agreements and some multilateral agreements where of course uh, the, the the countries of the, uh, the Eastern Partnership are to a less or more extent involved as well. So, so it is linked and of course if the EU who are now getting slowly out of the crisis, not there yet, but sl slowly getting out of the crisis, if we via our different uh, free trade agreements with TTIP, the one we do with the Americans, with Japan and others, if we have become a healthier economy, of course demand will increase and that will, will bring new possibilities for our, our neighbouring countries who are looking to explore different niches and different, uh, di different new areas to have access to our market. So it is linked, all of it, of course, and when we can talk for hours about the, the regulatory convergence and, and technical things like that, but maybe I'll stop there as an introduction. <laughs> Thank you very much, Commissioner. I know uh, you talk about nothing else but the transatlantic trade no, and investment No, I was kind of looking forward not to talk about it today. <laughs> and I do want to ask you uh, how you see uh, the potential implications of TTIP uh, for the partner countries, but we'll come back on that. Um, William Malter, if I could ask you, um, in terms of how this fits into that bigger picture, how do you see it and how do you see the challenge really for the partnership to capitalise on developments, advances in the bilateral and multilateral trading system and meet some of the challenges that that might pose? Well, first of all, if you look to the bigger picture, you will see, I'll see it, maybe you, can, you, you, you confirm or agree, I see one of the real challenges for the European Union uh, that we go for why are the Eastern Partnership countries, why are Central Asia, especially the Southern Caucasus, towards Asia? 
this is a very, very interesting perspective, also business-wise, beyond all the political issues that are relevant for supporting this. And the Eastern Partnership countries have a serious role to play in making this working and in making this happen. You can, you can feel, you can see this as uh, the one or the others of those countries is describing themselves being a hub. A hub northeast and south, and, 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 and north and south and east and west. I think this is the real fascinating concept. And the second is partnership, and I just realized minutes ago that the partnership, Eastern Partnership, led to intensified regional cooperation, which is fantastically important for developing the strength, the strength of the region. And third, European Union plays a catalytic role in, in doing that and supporting that. And as EIB is the bank of the Union, the European Union, we are extremely supportive to play this catalytic role to create a business environment, to create partnership, to create market or support market orientation and all things like that. Mm. And this is, I think, the bigger picture, what we should envisage if we talk about Eastern partnership. It's extremely important to be, let's say, a key cornerstone of a bigger strategy. Thank you. And I want to come back on that catalytic role and an announcement indeed that has been made today uh, in relation to your role, to the Commission's role, but we'll come back on that in the discussion. Uh, but Marcus, if I could ask you, um, the title of our forum today was, and in this session, always referring to and beyond. Uh, why was that chosen? Uh, why this emphasis for you uh, on the beyond, if I can put it like that, as well as on uh, specifically the EU and the Eastern Partnership? Well, I think it has been stressed already. I mean, it's very important to have this partnership uh, because we need to have a, an integrated area with our neighboring countries. But beyond means, of course, you cannot separate this from the, from the rest of the world, from the rest of the trade relationship. And the Commission has stressed it already. I think the other things we're doing, I mean, the further integration with the Japanese economy, with the transatlantic economy, other things, can be drivers for these regions because, because I mean, they can uh, live up to the challenges and be suppliers to European companies and, and integrate in the value chains with the specific advantages they have. And this goes from, from labor costs to others. Mm. So, of course, in order to be able to do so, to come to the challenges as well, they will need to, what we were discussing this morning, uh, do the reform which are necessary to, to adapt to our standards, to adapt uh, to, the, uh, to, the, to, the, to the European legislation in order to be able to be integrated in these value chains. And I totally acknowledge, and, and this is why the role of the EIB, but also in business supporting this is so crucial, and of course the European Commission, this is a hell of a transition process. But I think this is the way forward. And one more sentence for an introduction, we'll come back to this. Uh, Willie Walter has stressed it, and I think this is very important. It's about the, also the regional integration of the area, because it's about uh, economies of scale. And of course, uh, some of the markets are not really large markets, so they need to integrate internally. And this has to do with, of course, also investments in infrastructure and so on and so on. And at the same time, they all need to play alongside the, the same rules. And this means we would very much favor, of course, uh, to have them all in the WTO. Absolutely. I'd like to come back uh, to that in the discussion. But Hendrik, from your point of view, uh, and looking at the opportunities out there for businesses, um, and Mark is saying that, you know, and, and all our speakers, you can't separate this from the bigger picture. Do you think there has been a tendency in the past perhaps to treat this in a little bit too siloed a way, which makes it hard for businesses to really take advantage of the opportunities within a, a more global framework. I think that's right, to a certain extent. Um, Jackie, I think really the point that I wanted to make is, from my perspective, and I speak just on behalf of one multinational company, is that there is definitely a lot of attraction to uh, regional cooperation, f also from the perspective from a US company. Um, you know, having the opportunity to see that uh, countries that engage with the European Union, for instance, uh, in a, a more formalized trade agreement context sends an incredibly important signal to investors, which is we're open for business. And it basically constitutes a declaration of intent 
that uh, the countries with whom you know the EU and, and the United States as well engages into uh, trade agreements are willing to put uh, efforts in creating the right uh, environment to attract not only more trade, which is important, mm. but the real key is to attract investments. Yeah. Mm. And investments is really what's going to make a big difference, I think. Yeah. And a, a, con a company like GE, you know, uh, has over the last decade invested tremendously in the European Union and is now reaping the benefits of it because we're, you know, achieving every year t approximately $25 billion of revenues in the European Union thanks to investments. And uh, to state the obvious, you know, the European Union today, which is something that is, you know, I think overlooked by conventional wisdom too often, is today's largest, um, largest economy in the world. It's responsible for most economic output in the global economy, more than the United States, more than China. And it started last century as a relatively loose, uh, you know, market integration of six independent nations based on essentially a deep free trade agreement. Mm. And so there's tremendous, tremendous prospect and opportunity here. I want to come back on, on the deep and comprehensive free trade agreements because of that element of the trade-related reform designed precisely to attract that investment and the implementation challenge and, and an initiative announced there. But before we do that, in terms of this bigger picture uh, and the TTIP question, uh, the EU's negotiations with Japan, um, it's very striking when you look at the figures, actually, for this region, uh, that the U.S. is below China uh, in terms of its trade uh, with this region. Uh, I mean, both are a long way behind the EU and Russia, uh, but the U.S. markedly behind even China. So I'm wondering there if, if there is a real opportunity and whether you think, Commissioner, you talked about TTIP in a broader sense, you know, if we have a healthier economy because of it, then everybody benefits. But do you see any particular opportunities coming out of those negotiations, assuming they're successful, for partner countries? Or is it more this broader question of internationalization that Marcus was alluding to. Are they direct benefits or are the benefits less tangible? Assuming they're successful? I never wish hmm. to presume, but with you at we'll the helm, I'm that. sure they will. We'll be. talk about that <laughs> afterwards in the bar tonight. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, um, in, in general, of course, everybody benefits of it, but, but I think with our closest neighborhood who are not trying to define uh, their possibilities, their, their ways to interact and to take benefit of the big European Union market where they were uh, seeking to explore how their small and medium-sized companies can, can, can benefit, how they can link into the European companies. Um, I think it, it creates a big opportunity because then, of course, they can be if European companies are, make more business with the U.S. to facilitate it, of course, if they can link into the value chain, uh, that will mean a lot of them for, for them as well. And they are right now exploring this. Also, we are seeking in the, the TTIP negotiations to harmonize and to recognize a lot of standards in technical areas, in engineering, in, in, in pharmaceuticals, in, in the car industry, in, in uh, cosmetics industry, in medical devices, where many small companies, of course big companies, but also many small companies are involved directly or indirectly. And if we can agree on standards, there will only be one standard to relate to. That would be the EU American standard, slowly being the global standard, we hope. And that facilitates, of course, if you want to, to explore both markets, the American and the, the European. So this is a particular issue that, that I think can be beneficial for, for many smaller companies when they make their analysis mm. uh, because then of course that cost which is considerable for small companies will, will be reduced or even disappear. Sure, that, that issue of standards did come up uh, not surprisingly in the discussions the digital economy discussions that we've been having this yeah. afternoon um, but so uh, William Mulder, big opportunities out there, how can the EU International financing institutions help the partner countries, specifically in this area, or to take advantage of those opportunities. What do you see the role of the partnership, of the IB and others, in helping to make sure that they capitalise on that bigger canvas, as it were? Well, first of all, I think we have to start with, with, with showing the positive, the positive results we even have achieved within month. If you look at the figures, for instance, I have seen the figure for Georgia today, 
Just within the six months after signing the association agreement, exports are risen by 12%. There are even sectors where it was tripled within the six months. That means it is a real positive perspective. The second thing is don't underestimate how best practice is working. The good example is the enemy of the bad. <laughs> I, give you, I give you also an indication. We have uh, uh, prepared, based on the TCFDA facility, which by the way is a strange abbreviation, but this is another it's story. It's terrible. It's <laughs> terrible. <laughs> to confirm countries in the Eastern Partnership that it is necessary to support the private sector to create an entrepreneurial environment, to go and to concentrate on the strength. One of the strengths, for instance, is agriculture in this area. And you have the opportunity doing that to go for two or three extremely relevant issues. The one you just mentioned, Commissioner, that's the question of the, the standards, the quality to improve the quality to, book, to access the European market. And the second aspect I would not underestimate is training and education. Mm. Because what we see that we make investment happen along the value chain, we EIB are supporting this, not to have, let's say, misallocation, extremely important, and second, also to take technical advice, financial advice on board, and also to make education and training as part of a strategy because you need skilled people to do good business. And I think this is the broader, the broader concept we are envisaging together with the Commission uh, and Eastern Partnership is, is one example out of others. And, we and just to, to, sure. your, to, your, to your question, why is the United States uh, not that present? Frankly speaking, we are talking about European neighborhood. We talk about European neighborhood, and what concerns me sometimes a bit more is why are not the Europe, all European countries active in this region? We should not complain about the states. Why are the Europeans not there? And do you have an answer to that? I think we have to convince them and to show up. Uh, to show up, EIB is one, 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 one let's say, vehicle that it is really attractive to invest in this area. The countries have to do a lot. Maybe we come back at, uh, on this. Yeah. But it is really an opportunity. And if you look at the bigger picture, the long-term perspective, think about what is, what's the possibility to connect Black Sea and Caspian Sea. Think about the Silk Road strategy. Oh. Marcus, in terms of this you know, let's look, look to ourselves. Why aren't European companies now? Why aren't uh, your members, do you think, investing uh, as much as, as maybe they could? We, we heard all day about this enormous potential, uh, but it's being held back. You pointed to some of the issues this morning. You talked about the reform agenda and not as much progress as you would like. Um, but in terms of, of helping these countries, two questions really. Number one, why do you think we're still struggling so much? And number two, I asked what the EU, what the EIB and so on could do to help countries take advantage of this bigger canvas. What we talked about the role of business associations this morning. What can business associations do in this area? Well, first of all, I mean, these stories also go in waves, I would say. So we had, and then we were discussing this this morning, we had a situation where there was the real enthusiasm about investing in Central and East, Eastern Europe. Mm -hmm. And then there was the follow-up enthusiasm to go beyond. Mm -hmm. And this was a positive mood. Uh, then, of course, a lot of things happened. I mean, part of the neighborhood of the neighborhood starts to uh, behave a little differently, which is one part of it. Uh, then, of course, I mean, we had the economic crisis, which is, of course, uh, giving another burden. And, and so, and we discussed this this morning, of course, now, uh, in some areas, we, we rather have consolidation tendencies. But I, I'm a strong believer, and, and, and Willy Mortar has stressed it, about long-term strategic approaches. And, and if things are strategically right in the long term, uh, then there is still benefit in, 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 in continuing to investing it. So what can be done? I mean, first, I mean, we talked about the reforms. This is absolutely necessary. Then, second, it's about uh, making the information available, and it's, it's a similar debate we, we, in this case, even have transatlantically, even so it's totally different. 
I mean, sometimes we, we get the feeling that not all the information is there, so, so you might think about creating internet platforms uh, to, 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 to get the information, what you need to do in order to get things right, in order to be able to go there. Then it's about creating an integrated area, and this is where, of course, beside the states and the companies, also the business uh, federations come in. And uh, my friend Vitalis Gavridos will talk about this in the next panel. Uh, I think there are steps amongst the federations to go in this direction, and this is very important. Then, of course, it's about technical assistance. Uh, commission does a lot, EIB does a lot. We try to work with our partners in order to, uh, to, make, to, make, uh, uh, to make progress here, but it's also about the way how, how we are doing our free trade agreement, however we call them, deep or kind of not. And, and of course, the one thing is uh, we need to do tailor-made, this is right. The other thing is, of course, there needs to be a certain level of integration, meaning uh, if, for instance, the rules of origin could be rather similar. Of course, this is helpful because this will help to, to do the accumulation afterwards. So all this is no-brainers, of course, and I know that doing it is more difficult than, uh, than, than saying it, but I think this is elements of things which could be done and elements of things we should do. And last point, uh, it's also about the SMEs. Um, and there is the same story. For the SMEs, you need to know what you need to do. You need to have the information. And, uh, and you need to get the security that when you follow certain lines that, uh, that you will get a certain result. Okay. I want to come back on that and I want to come back to this new facility. But before I do, Hendrik, I think you wanted to come in yeah, on this point. I, I just wanted to um, clarify or give a little flavor to what Marcus said because I think he's absolutely right. Um, you know, as, as you said, you know, corporate America has not invested in the region as much as, as European companies. Um, but you know, we, and, and one part of the reason I think is, 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 is too much market fragmentation, to be honest yeah. with, particularly for multinational companies. Multinational companies lead a big market uh, because that gives them certainty of, a greater certainty of demand for their products so that they can obtain a, a return on their investment. Uh, and, and so, you know, reducing market fragmentation is very important. Mark has alluded to it. But at the same time, I think we should not be mistaken and, and assume that removing market fragmentation equals uniformization. Because I think there's a tremendous uh, advantages and assets to having diversity. Uh, and, and we should not forget, that, forget about this. And, and, and businesses and investors also look for, within economic cooperation, uh, look for diversity. And if I just may make one example, uh, I'm not so much familiar with you know, investing in, in Eastern Partnership countries, but when I look at, at the European Union, if I may for one moment, uh, it's it's a, a very interesting blend of more developed market economies and less developed market economies. And corporate America, and GE for instance, has been extremely successful to tap into the advantages uh, that, you know, the, the, the Europe of the 13, the later, yeah. you know, uh, 10, 13 countries that have joined the EU for, you know, with the with the enlargement of the last 10 years have been, have been able to offer. You know, the skilled workforce, the skilled work, uh, the, the, the flexible workforce that, that these countries have to offer. You know, there's, I've looked up a statistic just before this panel. 11% of uh, the U.S. affiliates in the European Union's workforce is located in Central and Eastern Europe. But the annual increase of employment over the last 10 years, on average, yeah in Central and Eastern Europe of our employees increase has been 9%. And in Western Europe, less than 1%. Okay, so actually you're doing pretty well. I want to come now to the question of the deep and comprehensive. I wish you'd give them a new name. Deep and comprehensive. I, I mean, either we say DCFTA, uh, which sounds like, you know, that song R-E-S-P-E-C-T, uh, and easily to get wrong, or it's very, very long. Uh, but now you've added a new bit today, uh, and Marcus mentioned SMEs, uh, the facility for SMEs. Um, I wonder, broadly speaking, um, in terms of the implementation challenge, we heard there from Willem Malter about uh, the benefits, even from provisional application, 12% increase in exports in six months, staggering. How how you, if you could say a couple of words about how you see the implementation challenge more broadly and a word about Ukraine because it was mentioned this morning and you of course had trilateral talks last week so where we are with that um, and specifically this facility and what it's designed to do. There's a lot of money involved, two billion over the next decade I think. Commissioner first and then Willem Malter please. 
Yes, because and we, then I'll come out to all of you together, of course. And, and the figures <laughs> you mentioned on, on Georgia are even better if you look at Moldova. So, so it has been, been it's <laughs> close to 20% increase, I think, 18 and a half or something. Uh, so, so it has really been dramatic for, for both Georgia and, and Moldova. Uh, and of course, they are struggling now to implement it and to get the full benefits of it. I think you mentioned a few of the, the challenges. It's to get the, 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 uh, the, the, the economic reforms through, increase transparency, make sure that the customs work. Uh, fight against corruption, um, the, the liberalisation, uh, and well, the whole list of, of economic reforms actually support this, and that is necessary to get the full benefits of it. This um, DCFTA SME facility, <laughs> I agree, it's, it's terrible. It's a fund for those countries who have free trade agreements with us, Georgia, Moldova, and soon Ukraine, uh, to facilitate the, uh, their economic uh, reforms in order to benefit uh, of it and it's uh, it, it's about you mentioned it it's about engaging with the the small and medium-sized companies is to make sure that there is training that there is a knowledge it's about informing them about the, the possibilities it's about helping them to to implement uh, the reforms it's about doing the the, the necessary uh, knowledge that, that they need to have in order to 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 fill in the forms right to uh, to cooperate with their, their uh, fellow companies Companies, etc. It's all these small bureaucratic things that, that needs to be done to create a, a greater business climate. Uh, and, and I think that would be, we, we support it and then the EEB can come in and then there will be accumulative effects that can be considerably uh, important. So on Ukraine, uh, as you know, the, the provisional application has been uh, postponed until the 1st of January, but it will now enter into force the 1st of January 2016. That is sure. Yes. That has been the very clear view of uh, the, the European Union, the Ukrainians, and also the Russians who uh, have said that they, they do not see any, any obstacle to this. There are still some, uh, they have some concerns uh, on this. Some are related to the agreement uh, and can be, 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 be solved. Uh, it's about quite technical issues, uh, such as um, it could be, be um, veterinary certificates or, or some standards uh, that, that, that needs or some, some uh, more, more customs cooperation, data exchange, that, that can be solved. Some are related more to Ukraine and Russian cooperation where we have said that from the European Union we are willing to assist and to help to, to facilitate uh, this. So we had a very long meeting this Monday with the, the, the uh, economic minister from Russia, Mr. Lukayev, and the uh, foreign minister of Ukraine, Mr. Klimkin, and myself, and we went through some of these difficulties and we agreed that our technical staff will continue to, to work on this and to report to the political level no later than July. So things will, will continue and I'm quite confident that, that we'll be able to solve uh, these issues. So that, that will be music to the ears of a lot of people in the room. Villa Moldova, from the point of view of, of, if you could say two words about this facility, and more broadly, uh, the Commission communication on the future of the European neighbourhood policy talks about, and I mentioned it this morning, moving from a, what it calls a donor to an investment dynamic. Uh, and thereby emphasising the active role of the partners. What do you think that is going to mean in practice, uh, particularly in relation to the DCFTAs? Well, first of all, EAB has uh, uh, an experience uh, being active in this, in this region since 2007. We have in the meantime done a business uh, by roughly 4.8 billion, billion euro, which is something. And this uh, association agreement and this uh, DCFTA is opening a new chapter. And there is three main, or four main elements what we see. The first is we can provide products that is of course easing access to finance, which is crucial, especially for the SME, for the SME uh, business. What we need there, and I'm also crystal clear, we need a sound financial system in the countries to make this really working. That means a banking sector that is stable and that the sound is a key prerequisite. And I know there is a serious discussion in at least two of these uh, countries uh, on, the banking, on the banking sector. Second, it is trade facility because to support trade is key, which is potentially also enabling us, this DCFTA, to do this in the local currency because this is easing also bis, uh, for, the, for the business, for the business sector. Third, it's risk capital, because this is of course also increasing 
the, the market capacity in the financial markets, which needs, let's say, a certain time to be established, but the direction is clear. And the fourth element is technical and financial advice. Mm. This is key to make it working. And this is really the instrument, I would not go for call it paradigm shift, but this is a certain instrument that we go beyond what we usually thought is helpful, grants money. Grants money is nice to have, but it's not changing the structure. If we go for this type, this is really the long-term perspective to have a stable market-oriented economy, and this is what counts. Which brings us back to that point about the trade-related reforms yeah. that are very much embedded in the DCFTAs. Marcus, a thought on this and, and the implementation challenge. I mean, we heard there about the enormous uh, opportunities that it's opening up, but also enormous challenges uh, to do it. And I'm, I'm thinking here particularly, talking about various ways of, of helping with that. Do you think we need new instruments to help business in the partner countries transform itself to really take advantage of the DCFTAs? Uh, and if we do need new ways of helping them, is this the sort of thing, this new facilities focusing on small and medium-sized enterprises? Well, I, I would say it's very much part of it. I think, I think on the way forward, I, I think we all learned a lot in the last two years. Uh, I think the exercise which is done at the time being is, is pretty timely. And now it needs to be a, a mix of learning, tailor making uh, what we do and what, what Willie Mortar stressed, this advice side mm. is, is, a very important, is a very important thing. Because as I said earlier, of course we are asking a very heavy transition process from our partners here, which is very important because otherwise they will not be able to to, to be uh, fully involved in our value chains and to reap the benefits and also to, to enlarge our common market, so to say. But of course, this is, this is very tough. And, and we, we, we need to assist them. And then, of course, they're, they're, they're the Commission and the EIB play a major role. We have to play a role in order to, to, to also advise on businesses how to cope with the laws once they are once they're implemented. And we might also think about uh, mixes of uh, instruments and and uh, really knows what i mean this is about these blending instruments mm. uh, which is something i think is working pretty well in some sectors uh, but uh, but uh, it's not applicable to all sectors so and, you put uh, together the grants the loans the advice absolutely and, to come and, up with a and and it's about the whole package and i think this is a very good uh, best practice, so to say, and, and I think there's value in thinking about to extending this to, to other sectors and, 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 and to, to capitalize on this positive experience. Because it is true, isn't it, Henry, for any business, but particularly for a small company and so on, that support to internationalize, uh, that is, is it crucial because they see many, many barriers and they're not just access to finance or funding issue, it is about technical advice about support. And I'm wondering, presumably General Electric, like many other companies, does partner with a lot of SCMEs. Do you see a role for the big multinationals in helping in this process of enabling big and small companies in the region to work with you so that both sides can benefit? Absolutely. Um, look, I think um, you know, the first point I would say is that uh, one of the key reasons, one of the key criterions that we're, that we're looking at when we're investing is accessing customers, being close to customers. And so if you want to if, if, if you you know, improve investment, it's not only sufficient to uh, provide financial assistance, technical assistance, which is key. And by the way, if I may open a parenthesis, I, I think there's no... Any, any good reason why you know, the United States should not pool resources with Europe to, you know, to increase financial resources, uh, f financial assistance, technical assistance. I mean, there's, and then when you think about, when you think about the fact that uh, the European Union is, is the, for, for most, if, with one exception, I think, the, the largest trade partner of the Eastern Partnership countries, um, and, you know, Europe is the largest a trading partner with the United States, I mean, it's, it's kind of obvious that their interests are aligned. Um, but to answer your specific question, uh, when we, when we uh, invest, we invest where, where our customers are, right? And so anything that we can do to ensure that we help our customers obtaining commercial success uh, and improving the market conditions of, you know, the environment where our potential future customers are, 
are, are active is for us, you know, obvious, mm. to, be, to be frank with you. So the and important thing is for, for policymakers to, you know, to work together uh, and work through the business associations and everybody playing their part. I want to come back on the issue of tailor-making, if that's... Tailor-made works. I'm not sure tailor-making works in English, but there we go. Um, because I think, Commissioner, we have a particular example uh, this week with Armenia of we had a lot of talk this morning uh, about the importance of the differentiated approach and matching the aspirations and expectations of partner countries. So I want to get a word on that in a minute, if I could. But before I do, any questions or comments to what you've heard from our audience? Does anybody want to join in, or are you happy? <laughs> thought you would. <laughs> Hello, Luisa Santos, Business Europe. Um, on the overall environment, I think there is one aspect that was already raised in the discussions uh, also this afternoon. That's the question of the interconnectivity and the question of the infrastructure. Because I think that's also key when we are talking about the financial aspect, we're talking about the capacity building, we're talking about better integration between the countries and between the business, but the infrastructure is key. Mm -hmm. And it plays a huge role in ensuring this, this integration. So I would like to understand a little bit from uh, the speakers, and in particular from the European Investment mm -hmm. Bank, and also from the European Commission, because I think there is an effort where the financial support is key, but also the the legal framework is important. Sure. So if these partner countries are to take full advantage of this global opportunities, they need both. How do you see the role? I'm sure it's also an issue we're going to come back to in our last panel. Any other questions? I see one right down here. Somebody wants to make sure that I stay fit this afternoon. If you can meet me halfway, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Jonathan Peel. I'm a member of the European Economic and Social Committee. Uh, Jackie, you mentioned China. And, of course, the Chinese initiative of the Silk Road Economic Belt, and I think they're pouring in a lot of money, something like $13 billion, is it? Um, Central Asia, of course, has been mentioned too, and the strategy review is high on the uh, presidential uh, priorities for the Latvian presidency. But the Silk Road obviously leads into the Caucasus. And how far is this relevant to what we're doing with the Eastern Partnership uh, particularly in the Caucasian countries, and how far is this part of our strategic partnership with, the, with China, or is this something that we need to be more wary about? Thank you very much, and I think you had one, no? Yes? Um, Mariana Rufa, European Business Association of the Republic of Moldova. Uh, very much was mentioned about the business support organizations in the context of DCFTA implementation, and thank you so much for the facility, DCFTA SMEs facility, that will be granted to Moldova and Georgia and Ukraine at a later stage. I think that one very important um, conditionality in this uh, facility will be also internationalization of SMEs, uh, and where the concrete output would be the number of exports to the EU. Whether, because in this very case, if you really condition the uh, companies uh, by providing them the support, but also providing that this very support will be concretely targeted by exports, this being the final output, just in that very case we will be able to measure how much the export increased as a result of implementation of this facility. Obviously, in this regard, the role of the business support organization is tremendous. Because on the other side, we will be also uh, able to um, streamline our lobby activities and to facilitate export, but providing that uh, SME's internationalization is the final output. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Any last quick one? Or shall we go back? William Malter, uh, a question relating there to the interconnectivity and the infrastructure. And I should say there's a very interesting point that came out uh, of the discussions uh, in the transport and logistic groups about we tend to focus on new infrastructure, where the gaps in infrastructure are. Are we also focusing enough on maintaining and repairing what's there? I just throw that in because it did come up in an earlier session. Well, first of all, First of all, infrastructure is one of the key parts of our activity in this, in this area. Second, it is not EAB just. I would, I would simply say thank you also to other IFIs because in infrastructure you need partners. This is KFW, this is EBRD, this is AB, everybody is, is, is really there and we are absolutely happy to intensify the cooperation with the IFIs. 
Connectivity is one of the key elements if you go for this bigger picture. Yeah. And as Southern Caucasus was mentioned, I think that we have to but that we have to see what I said in the beginning. This east west orientation and it's not just the Silk Road. Think about what will happen if and when Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank is going to be active, and this is from next year. We have to be ready to cooperate with them. But I see also the north-south dimension, and I give you an example. We are active together with World Bank and others in Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan to support an electric grid which is, of course, providing electricity out of the Caucasus towards Afghanistan and Pakistan. This is a dimension we are re not really envisaging up to now. That means for us, infrastructure is more than just highways and railways. It's especially also relevant for the energy sector in this area and the region. Therefore, the regional aspect is, is key. On the internalization, and, and, and Moldova is a good example, I fully agree. But I would not say that it is just the question to what extent the entrepreneurs are successful in the European market. I would go beyond the European market. Internalization in these countries is more than Europe. What we are trying to do is, and Moldova is a good example, to, to offer our product along the value chain, because this integration of the market and the value chain is something which is extremely important. And the two examples we do have is in Moldova, the filier de vin for the wine sector and the fruit garden for agriculture. That means we start, uh, let's put it that way in a picture, from field and we end on the fork from field to fork, from stable to table. That means processing, storaging, everything must be in because otherwise we create, as I said, misallocation. And this is extremely helpful to have also the business partners on board to make this really, to make this really working. This integrated concepts, which is also taking, as I said, uh, sometimes this advisory component on board. Yeah. This is key, but uh, the, the, the connectivity is one of the strategic issues for Europe, which is far beyond Eastern partners countries just, but Eastern partner countries play a crucial role in this bigger strategy. Thank you very much. And Marcus, on this point about this emphasis on the whole value chain, and when we talk about internationalization, presumably you would, you would endorse that 100%. No, I would totally endorse this, but let me, not to, not to tackle the, 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 the story from the same angle, let me come back to something we've been tackling previously, uh, which brings me back to the transatlantic. Mm. And I think this is, this is very important because this is something when we succeed in doing this in the regulatory convergence and to, uh, to embrace uh, the similar standards as much as we can, I mean, this would very much also help this region. Because, I mean, let's face it, I mean, our partners here are already struggling with how they deal with the European Union as their main partner and other large neighbors which is sometimes very difficult for them. So if in, in an economic sense we also uh, behave like competitors uh, in investing and, and asking them to apply with certain standards, I mean, this can get very confusing. So what do I mean? I remember when we negotiated with our friends in Romania and the accession negotiations, they had signed an agreement with the US that they would apply Russia, uh, US standards um, well, back then the Commission told them, well, look, I mean, you will have to make up your mind whether you want to be part of the United States of America or uh, of the European Union. But what I mean is, uh, the more we agree on common standards, the better it is for the market. But of course, the easier it will be for our neighbors to know with what they have to, uh, to cope with in order to be fully, fully involved in the value chains. Can I just ask you also, you mentioned, because we don't have much more time, Marcus, just to follow up on that. Um, but it's a separate question. You mentioned the WTO. Yeah. Uh, and can you tell me how you see uh, the future in terms of these countries, the WTO, and how uh, this all fits into that multilateral pattern? Because you raised it and we don't have long, so I wanted to pick up on it now. Well, I mean, we have out of the six countries, we have two, which is uh, Belarus and Azerbaijan, which are not members of WTO. And, and certainly, I mean, there's progress 
in the area, no, not at the same pace, I would say, but I think there's progress, especially for Azerbaijan. But certainly this would help, because the more, uh, the more we play to the, same, to the same rules, the more it would help to integrate the, the area, uh, and maybe also beyond, and, and the more it would also help to solve uh, also questions with some of the other neighbors. Thank you. Hendrik, did you want to come in on reacting to that or, or indeed on this WTO question? Then we'll come to the tailor-making, if I In might. one word on the WTO, I think we need to be practical and focused. Uh, I think the WTO is a great um, organization. It's wonderful in, in principle. <laughs> but when the going gets tough, I think we should be focusing efforts on bilateral agreements. And I think that's what we're doing, mm. uh, number one. I wanted to pick up on the point of exports. Please do. Um, yes, absolutely, exports and even, you know, providing preferential access, uh, even if it's not bilateral, I think in certain circumstances is absolutely necessary because we can't be, from European Union or US perspective, penny-wise and pound-foolish. Uh, and so, you know, I think it's really, really clear that we need to keep our eye on the prize. However, the whole story is not exports, increasing of exports only. It's also about being smart about imports. And, and I think that's something that's very often, you know, uh, left outside of the picture. You know, it's, if you increase trade through cooperation agreements, not only, yes, you create increased opportunities for exports, absolutely, but you also create capacity for local producers who have the opportunity sometimes to import products at a much cheaper uh, at an economic, much more intelligent way than if they do it purely domestically, particularly if you're able to, you know, uh, uh, remove barriers to imports and tariff barriers and what have you not, or, to Marcus's point, you know, standards. Okay, thank you. Commissioner, please do pick up on any of those points if you want to, but I want to come to this issue before uh, we try and draw some conclusions of differentiation, uh, because uh, we know it's already in the Commission communication as one of the key areas to look at now as we undergo this review um, but also we heard a lot today in our panels this morning about the importance of tailor-made approaches about making sure that you fit the expectations the aspirations of the partner countries otherwise you don't get the shared ownership uh, you don't which is vital to drive the whole process um, you have an example this week I think because one of the questions in that consultation is do we need new instruments different tools that DCFTA's association agreements don't work for everyone we know that um, there is a development this week that suggests we're beginning to go down that road with Armenia I think can you tell us where we are indeed and, and that is key in the uh, the Eastern Partnership strategy that we need to find ways that everybody feel comfortable with of course the CFTA is, is is there now with Moldova and Georgia and soon with Ukraine uh, that is not the model that the three others have, have chosen uh, with Armenia just yesterday we sent a request to the to the council the Council of Ministers to get a mandate for a non-preferential trade agreement with Armenia that will uh, be, be fully compliant with their their aspirations also to be in the Eurasian uh, Union, but that would cover a lot of issues such as technical cooperation, standards, competition, customs, transparency, procurement, sustainable development. I mean, a whole range, I think, of 13 different areas where we cooperate. So that we hope that the Council will give us the mandate uh, to, to, to sit down with our Armenian friends and to negotiate and come that. And then we'll be open to find ways also with, with Azerbaijan and, and, and with Belarus, while, of course, supporting them for their WTO to your aspirations because that's important for a whole kind of, of reasons uh, but I think that that's the way to go and also to the question from my friend from the um committee down there. Uh, this, your question is really the title, Beyond the Region. In the review that the Commission is now, now doing together with the stakeholders, with, with your organization and the member states and European Parliament on, on the new uh, neighborhood policy, we are also talking about the neighbors of our neighbor. So, of course, where is, is the limit to, to that? China is maybe a little bit uh, too far, but China is important for so many other reasons in, in our trade and, and political uh, agreements. But, but certainly there, there is a point to, to, to look neighbors, but also the neighbors of the neighbors, because everything is, is uh, so connected. Thank you. Oh, and word on this differentiation, uh, is what is happening with Armenia the way forward, do you think? Is this the approach we're going to need to make sure? Because there is an argument that says without it, you achieve nothing, because if it doesn't fit the aspirations and what those countries want, then well, nothing happens. I think you are right on the one hand. This tailor-made approach is absolutely the proper one. 
and we are trying to do this. For instance, we do have now for Ukraine this trade support facility, which by the way covers export and import both, because you're absolutely right, it's key. For Moldova, we do have the affiliate of the fruit garden. We do have for Armenia an Apex loan for, for the SME business. We do have something similar in Azerbaijan. We do really make telemed things. But on the other hand, to be crystal clear, if you want to have a positive, sustainable, long-term positive perspective, you have to set a level of principles, mm -hmm. sound legal system, fighting corruption, to have a sound financial system, to have a predictable and investment-friendly regulatory environment. And I think we have to strike the balance to have on the one hand a level that is really the, the fundament and the tailor-made solution. If you just start with tailor-made, you will end up with a mess. We need both. Okay, want to react on that before we come to draw some conclusions, Hendrik? I agree. <laughs> there, are <certain laughs> things, there are certain things you cannot simply compromise on, right? And what you said is, is right on the, on, the, on the mark. You know, there are commonalities, uh, irrespective of, you know, the ad hoc, the a la carte approach, you're always going to find key commonalities that need to be addressed. Yeah. And I think Mr. Molter highlighted them. Yeah. Marcus, did you? No, I mean, not much to add. I mean, this is about the right balance between tailor-made and, and the red thread. And that's yeah. it. Yeah. OK, um, we are almost out of time. And I want to uh, do what I've been doing all day. And it can be uh, in relation to this broader canvas of multilateral trade, bilateral trade deals, all of that. Or it could be outside of this zone. But each, each session I have wanted to go back to the title of our overall forum today and ask you if for each of you you had to identify one priority, and Hendrik I'll start with you because I asked you the first question last, one thing that we need to do to ensure, and in your case let me put it like this, that companies like yours will, you talked about what you've done in Eastern Europe, but will seize the benefits, the potential that may be out there. Uh, to use the Eastern Partnership uh, to really realise a lot of business potential. Everyone says it's there. What for you is the most important thing that needs to be done from a partnership perspective, but also from a business perspective? We've talked about the role of business associations to make this a place where you as a company want to go, where you will invest, uh, and you will bring that much needed growth and jobs to the area. Look, I don't think I'm going to say something very original, and unfortunately, because it's, it's I think, the reality. Um, I'd say two things. I'd say, number one, as I said, we go where our customers are. So if we want to invest in, in any of the partnership countries, you know, we'll have to have business partners, which means we need to have economic reforms to encourage local economic development, to support the commercial success of domestic firms. That's what's going to attract investment from our perspective, number one. And number two, you know, we need, we need a increased predictability and transparency that will have return on our investments, which means the rule of law, okay. right? And, and there's no way around it. We, we, we push, we're in favor, we advocate in favor of rule of law, not only because it's an ethical thing, but it's, it's sound and wise business to insist on these things. Yeah. Marcus, so, I asked you this in a narrow question, so can I ask you here to focus your priority here uh, on, on this question of, of this globalised trading environment, this beyond that we've been talking about. One priority for you, and you, it can be for business, it can be for the policy makers, uh, to make sure that this partnership really can deliver in this broader canvas that we've been talking about. Well, then I have to make three points. The first one is I want to fully underline what, what, Hen uh, what Hendrik said on the transparency. I mean, this is really key, and uh, this we need to, to attract investment. The second point uh, is, is about SMEs, as Henrik has tackled larger companies, and this is about information. It is about uh, spreading the information uh, for the SMEs in the partnership countries, but also for the SMEs in the European Union, yeah. about the benefits of the DCFTAs and their related programs because of course we have a job to do there but we will have to find more ways to really make this message known because we, we are still not there and the third point as you have been asking about the broader uh, the broader perspective and uh, let me come back to what i said earlier on the transatlantic i mean if we can fix this i think uh, i think we have a much better opportunity in 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 integrating further 
Thank you very much. William Moulterer, your top priority. It's twofold. One is market orientation gives the right direction for transition. And second, we should take into account that we talk about partnership. Yeah. And partnership never is a one-way communication. It's always a two-way communication that mean, means we, members of the European Union, can learn a lot from those partners. Thank you very much. And that's a topic I'd like to come back to in our closing panel, because we have talked a lot about equal partnership uh, and exchange of experience. How do you make that really work? How do you make the partnership bit of the Eastern a partnership? But, Commissioner, uh, before we move on, for you, the most important priority to strengthen the Eastern partnership from a business perspective? Well, I don't think we have to invent something new. Huh? We, we are just embarking in the, the, the trade agreements whether they are tailor-made or DCFTIs, uh, to get them right, to get based on our values and on the rule of law, whatever they look like, and to get, get them implemented. Uh, that would be the, the best thing, because that, that contains a whole list of reforms that is necessary to achieve what everybody here has been taking, talking about. So, so I think continue what we've been doing uh, in partnership and with, with openness, uh, that, that will, will lead to, to, to success. Thank you. And if I can step out and do something I never normally do, my one priority would be find a new name for them. Uh, then it would be a hell of a lot easier to communicate the benefits to a wider public than having to all the time either use the acronym uh, or a sentence and a half to get there. But uh, ladies and gentlemen, will you join me in thanking our panel very much indeed. Thank you so much.